Hey, what is going on, everybody? How are you all doing today? I hope you all are having a wonderful and fantastic day today, and if not, hopefully you all will have a better tomorrow. Welcome, welcome, everybody. We have finally made it to Ruby, Volume 6, Chapter 1, Argus Limited. So we are officially back into Ruby season. I have to say that it feels good to be back in Ruby season. It really does. It's been a long wait, definitely a long year for the fans, and I have to also say that it's been a long year for Ruby as well. So, here's how I'm going to do things. So we're going to talk about the plot, we're going to break it down a bit, and I will talk about the animation and choreography. So, I will give my opinions on both, and we'll talk about the good and the bad in the end. So, and then I'll give an overall rating of what I thought of this first chapter overall. So, without further ado, sit back. Relax. I hope you all enjoy, and let's go ahead and jump right on into this review. Starting off, we see a mountainside, we see some trees, we see some snow even. And I have to say, for the beginning, with this scene, I think that they really did well with the engine and making the trees and the surrounding nature look very nice. I think they did well with the Maya engine this time on that one. It really looks very lively, it looks nice, and it really puts the setting up very well here, and I think that the snow was actually a good touch what they did. Now, when we look at the beginning, of course, we get to see the Manticore Grim. I actually enjoy the concept for these. I think they look very nice as Grim. We see Team Ruby fighting off against the Grim on top of the train, and to be fair, we haven't had a train fight in Ruby since Volume 2, in which that fight was very excellent in my opinion. But we do see the characters actually fighting alongside each other, and the good thing is we're finally seeing combo attacks again. I am okay with that, because we have not seen them in quite some time, and it feels good to finally see them again. We haven't seen them since Volume 4, so at least we did get to see some team combination attacks. And of course, Oscar is at a further part in the front of the train, and he's actually telling everybody about the tunnel. He screams tunnel and everybody starts to run. Weiss almost falls off the edge, and Ruby goes forward to save Weiss after a Batacore Grim tried to shoot a fireball at her, and Ruby saves her with her semblance. So I'm glad to see that Ruby is using her semblance again, because we didn't see it once in Volume 5. Good to see it actually being used. I'm glad, because it was almost like she was a blank slate and didn't have a semblance. So I'll give a nod to that, because that was a good thing. And we see them try to go for cover. And what they're doing here is a transitional method, because what they do now is they flash back. So we see Adam, and he is entering the throne room. And as he is entering the throne room, we hear the faunus of the White Fang tell him that he was a coward, that he left their brothers behind, and that it was his fault. And, well, what does he do? Adam's next best solution... Kill everyone in the room. Who cares about them? Slaughter them all. Because that's Adam's thought process. He is in that point of mind now that he is basically his own greatest enemy. He is not to a good point. And even one of them shouts before they die. They even say that the Belladonna girl must have a hold over you. So that wasn't too good for that guy, of course. Then again, it wasn't too good for any of them because they're all dead. And with their corpses all lying around, of course you have Adam sitting on the throne thinking about Blake, and he screams out of anger. And I will have to say that this was Garrett Hunter's most convincing voice acting in my opinion. I actually thought that he was very convincing for a change here. Now, one thing I really did like was when we were seeing the train station. The choreography here. I like that the characters in the background. I enjoy that they are moving. That is a good thing. I really like seeing that they actually have real movement like a person. I do like that. And we hear Crow narrating over the letter that he's sending to James Ironwood, and he actually states a little bit of a lie here, because the part that's true is that Gira Belladonna did actually lead the Faunus to take down the White Fang at Haven, but at the same time he said that Lionheart lost his life trying to defend Haven. Now, of course, we know that's not true, but I think that's also to just kind of signal that Lionheart wasn't a part of the opposition, that he died in honor of trying to defend the school. But we all know, like I said, that's not true. We know what happened. And it might also be a way to just kind of put it as Haven safe. Don't have to worry about it. And 
looking at it, it's a two week time skip. Now, I would have preferred if they were to do a time skip, maybe just a couple of days. But two weeks feels very extensive. I mean, yeah, previous volumes have had time skips to about a week to two weeks to so on and so forth. But this one, for this point in time, I think that they could have just done it right off the bat, or at least within a few days instead of two weeks, but that's just me there. But it's not a big thing to have an issue with. Now, we do get some humor, we get some humorous banter, and I've talked about this a bit. I don't feel that this humor here was forced. I think that it was pretty genuine, it was pretty enjoyable. So, I really... Don't mind this. Don't mind the humor between Ruby and Yang. Yang was very high-spirited, surprisingly. I was actually shocked by that one. But it's not all bad, I guess. And considering that Yang, this volume, is trying to learn forgiveness and trying to control her emotions better, that's a part of it. So, I mean, it's interesting, but we'll see where that goes. Now, I do have to say about Dean Dudley. Dean Dudley... They were referenced off of Twiddledee and Twiddledum from Alice in Wonderland, and I'm going to say it, I love Alice in Wonderland, always have, just, I love the story of that. And you can definitely tell that Dee and Dudley, they're not the sharpest crayons in the box, if you know what I mean. And they're trying to, obviously, pickpocket what they can, considering that they are the hunters that are actually hired for the Argus Express. And... I really like what Ospin states here, because he says, I hope they weren't Beacon graduates, and they were rushed off by Crow. I do have to say, Crow, excellent job. I really do enjoy Crow. Great character. But, what Ospin said, this is something that stands out, because not everybody that becomes a hunter does it for good reasoning. Sometimes they will do it out of greed, sometimes they will do it just to earn fame and as we know, Raven stated that her and Crow, their intentions were to kill other hunters that were to attack the Brahmin tribe. So, I like this. This, to me, is a good reference. It's a good throwback. And speaking of references, they did make a throw at Weiss actually leaving Atlas just to basically return to Atlas. Now, the way I see it, it makes sense that she would say something, because how can she not? She just escaped Atlas to pretty much just go back. So, I really don't think you couldn't have thrown that in there. I really don't think there was any way to avoid that unless people were just going to be like, oh, well, she doesn't care about going back to Atlas. So, <laughs> it's kind of like a double-edged sword, because you're sitting over here saying, well, yeah, she had to say it, but at the same time, people are going to think that, well, this is an issue because they had to bring this up again. So, I don't really mind this because I feel like it needed to be brought up. I think it needed to be said realistically but that's just my personal opinion on that take and of course they were going to decide to leave well they were having to wait on Blake and as we see Blake she is talking to Ilya and if you pay close attention the music to smile starts actually playing I personally thought that was pretty neat I didn't mind that I thought that was good for a send-off to Ilya because she's leaving now but the part to me that doesn't make sense about Ilya's leave is they changed her outfit. My confliction with that one is why give a character a new outfit when they are just going to leave? That to me doesn't make sense because usually when a character gets a new outfit, it's usually when they come back or they return to a series. I feel like it's a waste to give a character a new outfit if they're just going to leave. So to me, it's a... I don't know, I just didn't really think that it was deserved there. I mean, yes, her outfit looks nice and all, but I just feel like if they were going to give her this, just wait till she returns, because I don't see the point in her really having a new outfit if she's just going to leave. So I feel like it's kind of a waste. I don't think it's a waste for the future if they bring her back and then have her wear that, but I just feel like for the time that they put that in, I feel like it's a waste. And when we see Sun, here's something I liked about this. They play the music to When Morning Follows Night. So I did like that. I thought that was really cool. I liked that moment. I hated the sun has to go, but at the same time, if this does develop his character, then I'm not really against the idea. Because I think Sun is an underrated character. I've talked about this before. I do think he's underrated. I really appreciate his character. And in this scene, 
one thing I really like is that, as I've stated, Sun and Blake tend to bring out good characteristics in one another. And I like how this brought their characters out a bit more. I enjoyed this, actually. So, their send-off, well, although it is a sad one, I'm going to hate to see Sun go, but at the same time, he makes a statement, this isn't the last time you'll see me, but the thing that was sad was that he states, you don't need me anymore. That's kind of sad to me, because I think that when you have a friend, you always need them, even if they're at a distance. You know, friends should always be there for friends. And as Blake said, when he puts it like that, it's kind of sad. Yes, it, it very well is. But I think that in the end, this was a good send-off to Sun. And, of course, Sun gets that farewell kiss. And for the first time in Maya, we see Neptune. Neptune, hitting on Ilya. Heh, good luck, buddy. <laughs> That's all I'm gonna say about that one. Just, good luck. But, you know, it was good to see Neptune for the brief minute or so that he was there. Because <laughs> it wasn't really much. It was just really saying, hey look, we haven't had him for three years, let's throw him in. Because, you know, Neptune still exists. We just want you to be aware he's still alive, he's still here. But, I feel like... Speaking of Sun being underrated, I feel like the way that Sun had put it was whenever he said that he was going to basically try to get everybody ready for the Wildlands and all that. Just seeing Neptune just act like, oh great, you know, you're back. Ah, I was like, really Neptune? Come on, this is your team leader and, and you've been gone from him for possibly six months? It's maybe even eight months? And... You're actually kind of meh. Eh. You know, but then again, we don't know how long in the span of time that he's been there. Also, so he could have been there for one of the two weeks or or maybe right after the Battle of Haven. Who knows? But that's the thing. Come on, Neptune. Be a little cooler to you later. But so we say goodbye to Sun and Ilya. And now everybody is on the train to Argus. And there's some things I like about this. I did like the reference back to volumes 1, 2, and 3 with the bunk beds. How Ruby is on the top left bunk, Weiss is on the bottom left, Yang is on the top right, and Blake is on the bottom right. It really felt like volume 1 and volume 2 vibes. I did like that. I liked how they decided to throw that in there. That was pretty nice. It felt like good old times. And then Ruby is playing video games. Now, here's the thing I like about Ruby. She feels like Ruby. She feels like her old character. It feels like they have listened to the criticism in some ways, and it feels like they have tried to adjust the characters more accordingly and tried to get them their characteristics back. And I like that they've done that because Ruby was always that nerdy kind of character who was always pretty energetic. And... I like seeing this Ruby again, because she feels like a character again. She feels real. I like that. And considering that she wants to play video games, Yang is going to do so as well. Now, this next scene, I have a little bit of a complaint about. Because you see Blake go to help the Yang get her bag. And Yang is telling Blake that it's going to take a while for everything to be okay. But it's going to be fine over time. And... Don't get me wrong, I do want to see Blake and Yang really talk about this, but for it to be so easygoing, I mean, it's been two weeks uh, in the time skip between volumes 5 and 6, but I feel like there should still be tension there. My reason for saying this is because Blake had left Yang, and as Yang stated, she had issues and she was frustrated and even pushed Blake away during that time that she was gone. She didn't care whether she came back or not. And of course she did, really. But I really would have expected Yang to be at an arm's length from Blake. <laughs> I'm, I'm awful. But I really would have expected her to be more distant. And it seems like she's just okay. And it feels a bit weird to me. Now, maybe she's thought this through over two weeks, but I don't know. I feel. That, that could have been written a little better. And then we go on to the present moment because this leads up to the 
present time that we saw at the beginning where they start fighting the Grimm. And one thing I like before they start fighting the Grimm is when Blake states, just my luck, and Crow says, not your luck. I like that because that goes back to Crow thinking that he is nothing more than a bad luck charm because of his semblance. That's a good throwback. I'm fine with that. That's a great line. I do like that. But then we get the fight. And I have to say, the mana cores, I like them. I like the design of them. I think they look great. And we have Dudley and Dee out there, and they're trying to fight him. And of course, the mana core takes Dee as he's about to try to attack the Sphinx. And he dies. Now, I think that this is also a reference, because... Even though these two characters are based off Tweedledee and Tweedledum, I think that they also went with a Humpty Dumpty vibe, because Humpty Dumpty sat on a great wall, and he had a great fall. I think that was kind of the reference to killing D off, and he also reminds me of Star Trek with the red shirts, because you might as well just put one on him, just saying. But we see Oscar also trying to keep everything under control, because Ospin wants to take control and thinks that he should basically create a panic by saying, Hey look, Grim, panic. Because that's what would have happened if he had said anything. So I like that Oscar was trying to take control here. Then, of course, that leads Team Juniper to also get involved because they find out about the Grim. Grim are attacking the train. So, yeah, they get involved. And we see that Dudley had also activated the turrets as security to protect the train. And one thing that was weird to me was, yes, he activates these turrets. And yes, they are killing the Grim. I do find it a bit strange that... Crow wanted them turned off, but, I mean, I guess at the same time, considering that they are activated, and that they are shooting the Grimm and killing them, I guess at the same time you could say, okay, well, they could lure them to the people because they are also above in the cars where the people are in, so, I guess that's like a double-edged sword, because it's like, okay, we have the turrets, we're killing them, we're luring them more, but then we have the people who are going to panic. So it's like a double-edged sword, really. I don't know. But... They're attacking. Oscar's trying to get Dudley to turn off the turrets. And then the Grim back up and they think, what's going on? Oscar screams tunnel. Everybody goes for cover. And when everybody goes for cover, there's a scene with Dudley where he's trying to go for cover. And yeah, he breaks his arm. And I'll be straight up honest with you. I thought his arm was going to be snapped off. I thought that was going to be gone because, you know, just saying train going full velocity and it goes through a tunnel and your arms right there I would think your arm would get ripped off but eh, happens I guess but he was injured and then we have crow who I don't know I don't know if he's got that drunk rage going on but he slams Dudley up against the door and he tells him that hey you know I told you to turn off the church you're an idiot why didn't you listen going off on him and Ruby's paying attention. And what I like here about Ruby is she stands up as a leader in this position because you have the passengers who are terrified of the Grim that are attacking them. And then, of course, Crow with his negativity towards Dudley and Dudley's negativity, it's not making things any better. So she just asks him to turn off the turrets. And then this is when we have Ospin take over and tell them what's wrong. Yet again, another moment of Osmond keeping secrets. And he says that, oh yeah, the Grimmer are attracted to the magical MacGuffin. And, boy, this thing seems like more of a mess than it is worth having. It really does. And people complain about why wouldn't the Grimm have actually attacked Haven during the time that they had actually gotten said magical MacGuffin. I'll explain why. Because the Grimm... As Ublek stated in Volume 2, they know when to strike. They don't just go until an opportunity arises. The moment they were on the train was more of an opportunity because the Grimm could still be attacked by the citizens and any of the security that they have in the city. So, due to what Ublek said back in Volume 2, I would say that the Grimm are wise enough not to attack in such a big area. Now, I like how everybody is distrusting Ospin more and more, because he keeps on doing the same thing. He keeps being shady, he keeps keeping secrets. From his allies, no less. So, good job, Ospin. And the relic, being smaller, that has to be because of magical MacGuffin powers. 
because eh, just makes sense. But looking at the idea that Ruby has, because she splits this whole argument apart because the people are stressed. They are throwing out negative emotions, which the Grimm are attracted to. So it makes sense that Ruby wants to cut the cars off from the train so that they could split the passengers up from themselves. And then that's when it leads to Ruby promising John that they'll make it back because he asked them to please make it back safely. And she promises to do so. So then Nora, with the big brain there, comes up with the plan to have Lyren use his semblance on all the people and just have their emotions be nullified so that the Grimm cannot detect them, so that they can, you know, have Team Ruby be the distraction. And so as the Grimm are actually coming out of the tunnel, this is something that you hear, which is the new song Miracle, and I want to talk about this for a brief moment. So I want to make a shout out to Lyren because he actually was the one to send me the part of the lyrics that was in this episode, so shout out to you, Lyren, and thank you very much. It's greatly appreciated. So the song is called Miracle, and here are the lyrics to this. Time and time again, it seems, we reach the point where all our dreams are crumbling all around us. Every outcome unjust, every step, it seems, has led us further from our goal instead. Our triumphs hasn't mattered, we're drifting ever backwards, and we're running out of time, nowhere near the finish line. And it's growing ever clear that a reckoning is near, and we'll have to make a choice, is this path right, or is it made of lies? We're looking in ourselves, trusting in the light. A miracle is all we need, but there isn't one in sight. Each and every passing day, a world's in further disarray. Confidence descending, where's our happy ending? On a path, but still we strayed. Our aspirations quickly fade. Desperations rising on hopeless, bleak horizons. Every life is on the line. Can't wait here for a sign. And, just like the blood that's shed, every cancer's sure to spread. And the time to act is short. We know inside we're born to do what was right. Desire to preserve life is powering the light. We're praying for a miracle, but for now we'll stand and fight. So, I'm gonna say, Jeff Williams, good job on that song. He did an excellent job on that song. And those lyrics really tell us a lot for what's to come. I really, really enjoy that. And of course, seeing Jean use his semblance to amplify Lyren's aura to use his semblance, I like that. I really like that a lot. And... It shows you that Jean has an overpowered semblance. I mean, oh boy, that thing is overpowered. But the plan works, and what I have to say next is, after the fight's all said and done, because we see everybody team up, and they all take down the Grimm, we see Maria Caliberta, in which her last name is in reference to Skull, which is kind of funny, because if you look at her actual cane it has a skull where the hand should rest it's pretty interesting and she seems like a nice character and i'm gonna say it i think she had silver eyes at one time because she's blind now but with these lens she's able to actually see so i think that she was a silver eyed warrior one time and i think she's going to be influential to ruby's arc because, let's be real, Ruby's been eating this for quite some time. And so, this old woman seems like a nice character. She seems pretty lively as a character. And I like how she survives the crash, and she's just fine. There's no... she walks through the door, and there's no problem. I found this to be hilarious. Just like, oh yeah, everything's fine. Huh. Well then... You are one tough woman. I mean, wow. The power of that old woman right there. That's something else. But I am interested to see where they're going to go with her character. But I want to really get into some things now. I want to talk about the animation and choreography now. And I want to talk about some other things as well. So one big thing that I did have a bit of a problem with. Because there are some positives and negatives to the choreography. And I want to really talk about them for a minute. So looking at the choreography, I like the fact that there are no levitations and weird floating stuff going on. I like that the characters actually walk normal. They have normal positioning that a human body would have. It didn't seem out of place like Volume 4 and 5 
because volumes four and five they really felt like they were out of place on their positioning they really had weird stances weird poses things that didn't really make sense to me but it seems like they really fixed this it seems like they really worked harder on trying to get the choreography and try to make them walk normal and have reasonable poses poses that make sense that the human body would do so i like that but here's my negative i don't feel like the characters were as fast as they could be because they're supposed to be like super speed anime characters and they still feel sluggish in comparison to what they have been in the past now this is still better than volume five's animation 100 percent way better so i'm not complaining on that behalf I definitely enjoy that. And Crow. Oh boy. All right. I like you, Crow, but I have a complaint. The complaint I have here about Crow, he has been jobbing really bad ever since the Battle of Haven. And he did decent for some parts in this, but when it comes to the Sphinx Grim, I wouldn't really say this is a monstrously powerful Grim. Because it's strong, don't get me wrong, but it feels more like a mid-level Grim than it does something of higher strength, if that makes sense. And where did that strength and speed go that was brought up in Volume 3 about Crow? It feels like it disappeared, but I don't know. It just, Crow just felt like to me he was jobbing hard again, and I'm not a fan of Crow seeming like he's weaker than he is. I have that complaint. I think that he should be faster. I think everybody should be faster in general because to me it just seems as if everybody could have done better personally. And I think the fight was not bad, but another complaint I actually have. One more. I think the talking should be saved for before or after the fights. I don't think it should be daring. The one thing that I did have a complaint about also, this is another one I want to bring up, is when they do the whole scene with the turrets talking about that. I think that it kind of takes away from the action that's going on from the other characters. And I think that because the action that's going on with them is supposed to be the main focus, I think that that should pertain to being the main focus rather than creating a brand new conversation. So I think that the first wave of the Manicor should have came in personally and i think that they should have fought them off just you know kill the first wave off then the turrets could be luring the grim and that's where crow could bring up the statement hey the turrets are luring the grim you have to tell them to shut them off then that could lead to that conversation happening and then the second wave comes in with the sphinx grim and then they start to fight that and you focus on that fight after that and then the fight could come to an abrupt halt with the tunnel which, that wouldn't be bad because you're not going to see a character stand there and get hit because of the tunnel. So, I think that could have been better. The other thing I do want to say could have been better is I do think that when Ruby saves Weiss with her semblance, if you notice, it feels, when she's using her semblance with Weiss, it feels like it's just, it's not curving because you would think that when it curves... You would think that the pedal storm would curve, but if you pay close attention to when it's actually going in motion and whenever it starts to turn, it doesn't curve. So that was a complaint I did have there. Now, the semblance when Ruby was doing it by herself, whenever she was in the station, that just looked like a blob, but you could see it curve. So I don't have as much of a complaint about that one. And so I think that... They really need to work a little bit more on certain things, but at least the choreography feels a little better when it comes to the body movements, and I liked that the characters in the back actually moved very well. They moved fluidly that were background characters. I enjoyed that. So if I had to give this episode for a start to the volume, I think it's much better than volume 5 already for the start. And I feel like this is a better start than some of the other volumes. It's not the best, but... It's certainly up there as a better start to a volume. So I'll give it that. But I feel like also that they could have done a bit more with Blake and Yang's interactions. Had that be a little bit more tense, but not to an extreme, just showing that there is a little bit of uncertainty between the two. So I would have preferred that a little more too. But 
overall, if I had to give this episode itself a rating, I'd give it a 7.5 out of 10. It wasn't terrible. I do like it more than Volume 5 already, so that's a plus. They have seemed to listen to some of the criticisms, but I still feel like there are some things that they need to work a bit on. And one more thing that I almost forgot. The Blake scene whenever she's decoupling the car. I did like that with Adam. It shows that he's still in her head. And she's going to have to confront that. That's good. They're still sticking to that too. I like that and it feels like a reference to the black trailer. But anyways, overall I thought this was a decent episode. I thought it was pretty good. It was good for what it was. But anyways, I'll be back again on Tuesday. Let me know what you think down below. Do you agree? Do you disagree? Let me know what you think in the comments down below. But anyways, thank you all for watching. I hope you all enjoyed. And if you did enjoy, hit the video with a like. Subscribe if you want to see more content like this. And share this with your friends if you found this informative or useful. Well, anyways, I hope you all have yourselves a wonderful and fantastic day today. And remember, if today was not a good day, tomorrow could always be better. Take care of yourselves and everyone around you. And have yourselves a good one out there, everybody.